Well, thank you very much, Linda. And uh, as Linda mentioned, um, she and I became acquainted when I was organizing activities for Women's History Month. And there was a panel discussion that uh, Linda facilitated for us. And Darlene was one of several women that were highlighted from um, the earlier days of the lab's 70-year history as part of the lab's 70th anniversary celebrations. Um, Darlene, to me, is, is um, an incredibly inspirational character. I, show you, I start on this first slide with just a couple of photographs, a very early photograph, and then um, this photograph from 2000. Darlene's career in radiochemistry spans 65 years, and so I think it's um, absolutely appropriate that this talk should take place on the anniversary of uh, the Trinity event. As many of you know, Darlene had a very illustrious career at Los Alamos, but I'm going to also take some time to highlight some of her other activities. And um, as there's time to do so, I'll toss in some personal recollections. And I particularly invite those of you in the audience as, um, as stories come up and maybe toward the end of, of the talk, if, if you'd like to share stories of your own, I'm sure that we'd all love to hear them. So uh, Darlene, for me, um, is remarkable for her technical accomplishments, but also because of her, her can-do attitude. And I'll, um, in the talk today, I'm going to talk about technical achievements, and I'm going to speak about her leadership and service. I'll only have time just to touch on a few things. And so um, with this much time, covering 65 years is kind of a challenge. But one of the take-home messages I'd like to leave us with is the spheres of influence for somebody with Darlene's vision and drive. She really influenced a lot of people from a lot of different fields. Myself in particular, I'm, I'm a tr what's called a transuranic researcher. I do inorganic chemistry on things that just so happen to be radioactive. Darlene's activities spanned a much, much broader range. She was very active really at the um, fundamental processes in the nucleus of the atom all the way to identification of new elements, their chemical properties, things like new separation techniques. And um, I'll be talking about a few of those. And true to the introduction and uh, Linda's invitation, I'm going to include some slides just arcing toward um, radiochemistry pro programs and radiochemistry um, techniques that are developing both at Los Alamos and at Livermore. I didn't in include a, a larger set, but I'd like to touch on those two national laboratories where Darlene spent so much of her career, has, has spent so much of her career. And I must highlight for all of us in the audience who are younger than Darlene, who is now 87, she still is active. Not only is she, um, she's active in, in service for panels and um, really advocating for training the next generation of radiochemists. She also stays active as a musician and she swims still regularly and she's um, active in mentoring. So I think she's a terrific role model and I would say that that's a pretty good um, sphere of influence all by itself. So I want to start with um, the early beginnings and I really am encapsulating all of this in a single slide. Darlene was born in 1931 in Terrell, Iowa. Her family had a history of farming and education. Her father was a public school superintendent in Iowa, meaning that the family moved several times. Um, she lived in Terrell until she was about eight years old. She completed first and second grade there. When she speaks of Iowa, at least the stories that she told me, most of them are from her earlier days in Terrell because that's where she learned how to swim, which was a lifelong love. Um, she also had, has, um, had a younger brother who was also a professor of chemistry um, who worked at the University of Oklahoma for many years um, and he uh, uh, passed away in um, I believe it was 2000 and uh, his name was Cheryl Christian. So um, Darlene began her um, undergraduate work as a fine arts major which she points, uh, pointed out to me was in the home economics department which I found a little bit surprising when we first met and I thought well how did you end up from you know okay growing up on a farm with school superintendent as a father well my mother loved music her mother had, was very passionate about music and civic responsibilities two things that um, Darlene carried on throughout has has carried on throughout her life um, and so she was very influenced into the fine arts in fact she was really um, challenged to decide between music and art. 
She's um, an accomplished pianist and flautist. And um, so if you're ever at Darlene's home, you can often hear um, wonderful music playing in the background. But she was required in home economics to take a chemistry course. Another point I found fascinating, that in um, the 19... Uh, 40s and 50s that home economics should include a chemistry requirement. I think that that's a great message. But it, her chemistry professor was a, um, a woman by the name of Nellie Naylor, who Darlene always points out as a, um, a very early driver and mentor in her career. She was a terrific role model. And so when Darlene's um, second quarter of, of her first year of college um, came around, she met with um, her advisor and said, I'd like to switch to chemistry. And her, uh, her fine arts advisor said, do you think chemistry is a suitable pr profession for a woman? To which Darlene replied, well, of course it is, because Nellie Naylor is my chemistry professor, and she's wonderful. And so uh, Darlene did switch her major. She continued at Iowa because she, as she uh, described to me, she viewed herself very much as a small town um, young woman. She wasn't ready to venture out into the world and she wanted to stay in Iowa for graduate school, which she did. In her first year of graduate school, gra she met uh, Marvin Hoffman and they married um, three and a half years later in 1952. Interestingly, she and Marvin, their uh, uh, graduate school uh, theses were both on photoradiochemical reactions. And in graduate school, um, they were quite the dynamic duo. In the e Darlene, um, as she continues to this day, was very interested in um, looking at the chemistry of, of newly produced radionuclides, and that's a theme in, in her career. Well, uh, Marvin knew how to run the reactor, and so in the evenings, they were quite the couple, kind of reminiscent of the Curies, if you know that story, as most, most of us do. In the evenings, Marvin would run the reactor to make the isotopes and Darlene would do chemistry on the other end. Darlene preceded uh, Marvin in um, earning her PhD ab about 10 months to a year early or somewhere around that time. She went to Oak Ridge on her own, which was quite uncommon at that time for a married woman to precede her husband to the next stage in their career. Marvin joined Darlene uh, for a short time in Oak Ridge. He had done uh, summers research at Los Alamos in 1950 and he first secured a, posi a position at Los Alamos and um, as Darlene re and Marvin recant the story, well there was such an active and vibrant radiochemistry effort at Los Alamos that surely someone like Darlene could have a job there. Darlene um, did indeed, there's, there's some stories around that, that, uh, that whole transition, but she became a radiochemist at Los Alamos which was then uh, the Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory. And Darlene has, was really motivated um, to go into chemistry in part by the study of radioactivity and the in inspirational story of Marie Curie. So now I'm going to um, flash forward to um, the, some of the work in, in Darlene's early days at Los Alamos, which really were around the nuclear weapons program. So I'm not going to talk anything about that classified work and in this unclassified setting, but I'm just going to highlight a couple of discoveries. But uh, one of the take-home messages for me is the whole um, opportunity at the laboratories like Los Alamos, Livermore, to do f um, fundamental research while you're also contributing to the applied programs. And that was certainly true of Darlene's career. Um, one of Darlene's um, most frustrating points in her career is when she first came to Los Alamos, her security clearance was not transferred with her. And in fact, her, when she arrived at Los Alamos and she tried to, to uh, go to the Human Resources Department and um, uh, assume her position as a radiochemist, she was told, uh, we, don't, we don't know anything about you. And radiochemistry? Well, surely you're not going there because we don't have any women in that division. So she went home and she was very frustrated. And, uh, but some weeks later, Marvin had been invited to um, a new employee cocktail party um, at Director Bradbury's house. So in that days, for all the students, the way that you were welcome to the laboratory was you met with Norris Bradbury and his wife personally at a cocktail party. 
And Darlene um, met at that party Rod Spence, who was a group leader for one of the radiochemistry groups. And he said to her, where have you been? I've been waiting for you. And so you can imagine her frustration. She says, well, you know, I'm right here. I'm ready to work. And she, he said, well, I need you as absolutely as soon as possible. We have a lot of work going on. And one of the pieces of work they had going on was this, um, was the analysis of the mic, the fir first thermonuclear war, the first fusion um, explosion that was um, at Enowatak Island in the South Pacific. And in the debris from the mic test, new elements were discovered as well as new isotopes. Darlene, when almost um, any time a story would come up regarding nuclear weapons testing in the earlier days or even element discovery, Darlene will tell the story of having missed this discovery because of paperwork and a clearance snafu. So it was, um, it's very interesting because if I flash forward to 1993 when I came to the laboratory, I too came, I already had a security clearance because Darlene had made sure I'd gotten one when I worked at um, UC Berkeley and at Lawrence Livermore Labs. And my clearance also did not transfer with me. And I called her, we were ta talking about it, she said she, she was far more irritated than I was because she could not believe in the intervening years that they had not figured out how to transfer a security clearance. And it, it, it really irritated her to miss out on this discovery. But I think it motivated her even further because she picked up on this initial observation of plutonium-244 and did some calculations. And she and George Cowan, putting their heads together, wondered if um, plutonium-244 could still be present on the Earth. And here's a photograph of Darlene and Francine Lawrence, her co-worker, who those two together actually worked on this problem and published a paper together. So the search for plutonium in nature, so this was sort of their calculations that there ought to be enough plutonium for them to observe. Well, um, and this is a story that sort of parallels Marie Curie's separation and characterization of radium for her second Nobel Prize in chemistry, this kind of separation of an element from ore and then characterization of it. In this case, Darlene was looking for plutonium-244 because of the thorium um, daughter product that they had seen from the Mike debris. And so in 1971, this paper was um, published in Nature. And it's one of um, the discoveries that Darlene is, is most well known for. She um, really had to reach out and form some strong collaborations in order to see this work through, which is another hallmark of her career. In fact, she relied on Molly Corp that had a rare earth mine in California to actually get the right mineral of thorium to be able to um, isolate enough of the thorium decay products as well as um, to be able to track back and try and detect 20 million atoms of plutonium-244, which in 1971 was truly remarkable. And Professor Seaborg, um, one of Darlene's mentors, really described this as an experimental tour de force. Some, one of the um, whole areas of research that Darlene was very active in for about 20 years, but we hear less about um, from her accomplishments and wars, is related to um, spontaneous and symmetrical fission. And one of the reasons why um, I included this story is because it, it really um, illustrates some aspects of Darlene's character and her nature. When she sees something in an experiment, she follows it up and she doggedly pursued it. And that was actually the case here. She, as she recants this story to me, she was looking at some, some fission um, data from, again, from test debris, from uh, looking at fermium-257, and she was analyzing minor fractions of the fission products. So really looking at all the details of the experiment, having it all make sense. And she uh, put out a theory that um, the, these, some of the Fermi isotopes could actually fission symmetrically. So the prevailing theories of the day were firstly that fission was neutron induced and not necessarily spontaneous. And secondly, that the parts, the fragmented parts from fission were almost always of different mass. 
And so um, the nuclear models that physicists had at the time, they, it, it wasn't consistent with this, these mechanisms of fission. So uh, Darlene actually set out on quite a course of research, including um, at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, which I'll mention in a couple slides. Um, but, and it turned out to be, as uh, Seaborg described, probably the most important discovery in the understanding of fission processes in the latter quarter of the 20th century because it was against the prevailing theories of the day, and this was new experimental data. This again points out the ability to glean fundamental science from nuclear testing. So I want to um, shift to another one of Darlene's first, and this is a first of a different kind. In 1979, Darlene became the first female technical division leader at Los Alamos. Um, and she, uh, she held that role for five years until she moved to UC Berkeley and Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. And one of the attributes that um, Darlene's colleagues remember her for is that she was instrumental in expanding the scope to other different fields. And so the, at the time when the, um, I and Darlene took over leadership from um, George Cowan for uh, chemistry and nuclear chemistry division, she sought, particularly in uh, um, 1981 and 1982, to expand the areas of chemistry that Los Alamos was working in. And she really um, pursued that um, in a very specific way. And she even points out that one of the groups that they formed just kept growing and growing, and they'd have to split it and split it. And it even um, was part of the, co the reasons why they actually organized into um, two they, they reorganized to form material science and chemistry division as these different fields were evolving at the laboratory. Now it might not, that phrase might not seem so remarkable in the current day, but I think it's a little more remarkable when you look at the org chart of the era. I, I thought this was really interesting, and, and he, but here are two of the folks that were instrumental in Darlene's career, particularly George Cowan. And so Darlene succeeded George Cowan as a division leader for CNC, and then Dick Baker's organization, they, they merged CNC, CMB, but then they took parts of it and they reorganized to form material science division and the isotope and nuclear chemistry division. Now, when you look at this, that, that's pretty remarkable, and, and some will point out, yes, but there was, there was another senior laboratory manager prior, when that was Jane Hall, in the mid-1950s, who was a remarkable nuclear scientist also. And she was an associate director um, in the, uh, under um, Norris Bradbury. And uh, Jane Hall indeed was very remarkable. I find it an interesting coincidence that she also studied nuclear fission. So, th but at that time, um, Darlene really was um, one of a kind. Oh, I didn't realize this was a multi-point slide. This is a slide from uh, one of Darlene's PhD students, one of my, my uh, friends and colleagues, Don Shaughnessy at Lawrence Livermore Lab, because I wanted to include um, aspects of current day radiochemistry from both of the national laboratories that have significant radiochemistry efforts. Um, and, and this is Dawn's slide to point out that after nuclear testing, so after the succession of nuclear testing um, in the early 90s, radiochemistry shifted to other mission areas. And that's true at both of the laboratories, although with a little bit different application. And so this just gives you sort of a snapshot of the kinds of, of research that nuclear chemistry um, is instrumental to today. And I want to give um, a call out just a flavor of the chemistry that's going on in the radiochemistry groups at Lo Los Alamos today. I only have time just to highlight a couple of things. Um, this particular slide comes from Susan Hansen, Alex Mueller, and Warren Oldham, a synthetic chemist, a uh, physical chemist, and a radiochemist, where um, one of the standard techniques in actinide chemistry for actinide detection, particularly for plutonium, is alpha spectrometry because it's one of the ways that you can distinguish plutonium in a complex matrix from americium and uranium. If you just look at the gamma, you could um, 
could underestimate or overestimate how much plutonium is, a, is in a sample. And so the gold standard of really verifying how much plutonium you have in a sample is alpha spectrometry. Usually the way that you make um, alpha spectrometry samples is you have a metal foil, you deposit your sample, you um, evaporate away the solution, and then you flame that sample because alpha radioactivity, as most of us know, cannot penetrate through a piece of paper. So it's really a surface technique. So what these clever folks have come up with a way to do is to form a thin film that has incorporated in it a Clawi ligand, which are kinds of chelate, clathrate types of ligands that grab onto the plutonium, but they have put it in the thin film so that they can then um, detect plutonium. Um, so this, this does away with the kind of um, making of the foil and the, and the sample flaming, et cetera, that it was usually done for plutonium analysis. It also has the advantage it's much more rapid. You put the solution on, you're, be, you're able to measure the spectrum very quickly. Um, another, just to point out, I, I want to include this slide. I won't go into the details, but this is from Warren Oldham and his um, recent LDRD research where they continue to look back to um, nuclear weapons debris and make new discoveries on radio, radiochemistry, including that of um, the actinides, uranium, plutonium in particular. And then I, I want to um, make one other point on uh, modern Los Alamos radiochemistry that there are now um, a whole different sets of techniques to measure um, plutonium. When Darlene was um, doing her work with plutonium-244, she really had um, a much smaller array of analytical techniques to rely on. And if they needed something new, they had to create it themselves. Now we have whole instrument vendors, and we can use techniques such as ICP um, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometers to analyze plutonium and neptunium isotopes, and they've, uh, the group at Los Alamos has come up with some, some nice new separation techniques to be able to use um, together with this instrumentation for more rapid um, and sensitive your, um, neptunium plutonium analyses that doesn't necessarily require counting. So usually the conventional techniques are counting techniques. So now I want to shift to the next phase of Darlene's career is when she became a full professor at Lawrence Berkeley Lab and a staff scientist at, um, excuse me, a full professor at, at the University of California, Berkeley, and a staff scientist at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. Um, Darlene, as she tells the story, often when there was a decision to make, she would rely on her lifelong partner, Marvin, and, and they discussed this in some detail because they were very happy at Los Alamos. They loved their home here. They loved their community here. In fact, they kept, home in, kept their home in, in White Rock, two homes, in fact, for decades after, after they moved to California. So it was a very difficult for move for them to make because New Mexico truly was home. But as, Dar as Darlene and Marvin tell the story together, you know, Marvin would say, well, you know, it was just the chance of a lifetime why wouldn't you go to UC Berkeley um, to be a full tenured professor and train the next generation of radiochemists? Why wouldn't you take over um, Glenn Seaborg's group um, at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory? And so Darlene, um, as, is, as is her trait, um, leapt into these new challenges and new opportunities. One of the reasons why she did that was because it also it would allowed her to um, use the resources at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory and the tools, including LBL's 88-inch cyclotron, to study the fission of Fermi isotopes. And so she had done some experiments. She went on a Guggenheim fellowship and spent nine months sort of as a sabbatical in 1978. And during that time, she really established some career-changing collaborations. I show her here with Diana Lee, who was sort of the long-time IT person for the Seaborg group, and then after that, the Hoffman group. And I also wanted to sh include this because I have um, some fond and not so fond memories of this particular counting wheel. So if you see this, what this is called a merry-go-round system, and I'll show a schematic in the next slide, but what happens is some isotopes get produced in the cyclotron. They go through a gas jet, they go through a number of tubes, and then they come in through one of these ports and get deposited in one of these little circles. Where, well, if you're a graduate student, as I was in the early 90s, 
one of your tasks was you would take these little washers, you would put little foils on them that looked like saran wrap, and you'd pop them into that hole. Thousands and thousands of them. So that was um, before the days of automated chemistry, cyclotrons, when you got cyclotron time, we would work in the middle of the night, we would prepare all our, uh, make all of our um, uh, sample spectroscopy sample collection um, ourselves. And so I have lots of fond memories working with um, Diana Anna, and Darlene and uh, making things like these uh, particular catcher foils on the merry-go-round system. So here's just a little schematic. Um, so one of the reasons that Darlene um, wanted to go to Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory was to do that atom at a time chemistry, not just for fermium isotopes, but also to take over Seaborg's um, group that was interested in discovering new elements and isotopes. And so they indeed did that. So um, this is just a schematics that shows that from the cyclotron you produce these isotopes, they travel through, they get deposited on these wheels, and they count them, that wheel that I, I just showed you in the last slide. And so the areas of research that Dar Darlene focused on at Lawrence Berkeley Lab were fission, electron capture delay fission, and then the production of these particular elements and isotopes. And I, I also wanted just to mention a story um, that Darlene had from um, her coming to uh, the University of California, Berkeley. She actually was welcomed to the department by, um, by a large number of those who were interested in nuclear chemistry because they saw that other capabilities around the, the globe were sort of catching up with Berkeley, and they really wanted to regain some of their preeminence in the field. And one of the things that she discovered when teaching is that their radiochemistry laboratory course had sort of gone into disarray. And uh, so she, one of the things that she did her first year um, at UC Berkeley was she herself put together all kinds of new counting instruments. She even called back to Los Alamos and said, send me your last generation instruments because I need it to teach students. And I remember my first radiochemistry laboratory course, um, there was a TA, and then there was Darlene, who was the full professor, and this very esteemed scientist. I was shocked when she would show up in lab almost every single week. I was even more shocked when I was, as a student, setting up my experiment, and she sort of nudged me aside to take over my measurement, and I said, wait a minute, I was <laughs> But that just tells you something about the enthusiasm that Darlene has for experimental science. And she said, well, let me just fill with it a little while. And so uh, I, had, I have very fond memories of my radiochemistry laboratory being directly taught by one of the masters. So I wanted to point out a little uh, one of the aspects of Darlene's career. Darlene um, prefers to remain apolitical. But when something comes down to a point, and if there is an injustice that needs to be corrected, she will engage. And I point out one particular example is there was a heated debate and controversy for a number of years over the discovery of elements 104, 105, and 106. The Berkeley group, having um, produced elements 104 and 106, the way that they made the elements and the way that they studied them, so they did a particular kind of synthesis reaction, and the, the way that they analyzed them was by um, looking at the chain decays of alphas. So if you have a, an iso, uh, a new element that you make and it decays by an alpha, and then it decays by another alpha, and then you have a long-lived product, for example, thorium, that you can count for a long time, then you can backtrack and say, what was the original mass of the element that you made? And they believed that, that was sort of the gold standard of identifying new elements because you weren't just looking at the, some new radioactive decay, which is difficult to measure but still easier than, than going through this whole process of following the decay chain. But by following the decay chain, they also identified the mass of the new element that they made. So they thought that that was really um, a better way to um, identify new elements that they would um, produce. The Dubna group claimed that they had made it first in Russia. Now remember, this is in the era of the Cold War. So this was one of those battles that occurs when, when you have the, in the era of these two superpowers pitched against each other in fields nuclear. There, were, there was high stakes at play here 
in um, projecting dominance in this area of radiochemistry. So um, much to uh, Darlene's frustration, these elements were not named the, the way that, that the Berkeley group had wanted them to be named. They wanted element 105 to be honium. Instead, it was called dubnium. But there was a silver lining, because at the same time, Lisa Meitner, who was another one of Darlene's role models, got her due and got an element um, in her name. But Darlene, um, for a number of years, was very active with um, IUPAC, the um, International Union for Peer and Applied Chemists, on naming. And um, some years later, in 1994, um, Darlene really got her way in element naming because element 106, which they had identified in the same way that they had identified elements 104 and 105, the same general approach, they got to name element 106 seaborgium. One of the reasons this was controversial was because prior to that time, elements were not named after living people. And so uh, Professor Seaborg, I remember him telling us the story at the time of, well, you know, I thought there might be a downside to having this <laughs> named after me because I am still living. So I don't want to tempt fate. Darlene thought it was a, um, she fought hard for, for naming that element. And she really looked at it um, both as, the, as wronging a right that had been done with element 104 and 105, but also um, really to highlight um, uh, Seaborg's career. And he really felt that this was one of the greatest honor ever bestowed on him because lots of people had Nobel Prizes. And he had a Nobel Prize, but he also had an element. So anybody who looked at the periodic table, if they got curious, they could look into his work. Um, Darlene also uh, recognized Professor Seaborg when she formed uh, the Glenn T. Seaborg Institute for Transactinium Science, which she did in 1991. Now I want to flash forward just a, a little bit with another piece of the story of current day research, which is heavy elements continue to be um, created, um, analyzed, and named today. And so I just wanted um, to point out that we have the new elements 114, 116, and 118, and they, they can all be tracked through this particular reaction if one knows exactly how to do it. And I want to highlight one of the um, leaders in this field is one of Darlene's graduate students, Don Shaughnessy, who is at Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. And this is one of her slides where um, she focuses on the ongoing collaboration, so now um, the Flareoff group and the Livermore group have sort of gotten, they have, um, they're working very closely together. Um, so the, the old, the old um, controversies of the Cold War are now left behind and they're co-developing techniques and um, discovering new elements. And just uh, last year, what, element 116 was named Livermorian. Uh, this is also a slide from Dawn, but I think I, I could easily show a similar slide from Los Alamos. But these are her um, particular specific examples of atom at a time chemistry. So remember I mentioned how um, in the time when I was a graduate student, you know, 1991, 1992, we were making all these things and we would do separations by hand. Well, Dawn's graduate students don't have to do that. They, ha they are instead um, developing these automated atom at a time systems. And so this is just a, a photograph of their um, gas liquid transfer. Again, what they do is they sweep out a target with salts and gas. Um, they dissolve that into a solution. They carry a solution into a separation scheme. Sometimes that separation can be very sophisticated with new uh, ligands, and then they rapidly analyze them. Uh, this is, so the, the, it's always, uh, in nuclear chemistry, most like other fields of science, they like to come up with an acronym that you can say. So this is Sheila, and this is glitter, and uh, these are for the rapid chemistry for very low volume separations, for very high sensitivity to get, if you're only making atoms, you can run an accelerator for, um, for, for example, one of the one element 110 experiments that I worked on, we ran an accelerator time for about 40 days round the clock, and we believe from our statistics we may have made 10 atoms. And we didn't have sufficient data from that to actually claim discovery of that element. And so this is quite um, revolutionary in the field. 
Um, Don also points out that there's a lot of other fields that these kind of rapid separation techniques can be applied to. So I'm going to now take a little bit of shift to tell just um, a little bit of my own story and where it intersects with Darlene. So this was the Hoffman Group at Lawrence Berkeley Lab in 1991. And um, there's Professor Seaborg, there's Professor Hoffman, and there's me. And I'm feeling awfully short next to the very tall Chris Ketcher and Professor Seaborg. And here's um, Ken Gregorich, who I'd also like to point out because one of he, like Diana Lee, who I showed a photograph of earlier, is one of the unsung heroes in element discoveries. His name's on almost every paper, but you almost never hear his name because what he loves to do is build all of the equipment and make it all happen. But I just wanted to, uh, to point out Ken Gregorich. So I, uh, I joined this particular research group in 1991 because I had been doing chemistry on the UC Berkeley campus with Ken Raymond in inorganic chemistry, and I really wanted to work with plutonium. And so, um, so Ken had introduced me to Darlene, and Darlene said, well, absolutely, you know, come on, come on over. And uh, I'll just also point out that um, Professor Seaborg was really interested in the research that I did as a graduate student because I did a lot of work with plutonium-5, which is a lesser known oxidation state of plutonium. He was very curious about the chemistry of that oxidation state. Uh, this is a list of the Hoffman graduate students, so I'm somewhere in the middle here, um, 93. Um, and uh, the, one of the reasons I show this slide is because a whole bunch of us went to Livermore, but only one of us went to Los Alamos. And it's interesting because I didn't know about this particular trend in about 1992, 1993, when I was talking with Darlene about you know where I was going to go after I finished my graduate studies. And I'd done a lot of research working out at um, Lawrence Livermore Lab. And in fact, when I was a graduate student, I'd written a grant proposal to um, the Department of Energy Office of Science, and it had gotten funded. So I thought, well, this is great. I have a funded project. I could uh, do this research at Lawrence Livermore Lab and make a great career for myself. <laughs> and Darlene simply said, you know, I just don't think that that's what you should do. I really think that Los Alamos is a better place for you. And I, you know, so she encouraged me to come out to Los Alamos. And so, um, long story short, I, I actually came and did a postdoc and have been at Los Alamos mostly ever since. And what I didn't realize at the time was that she had made a commitment to send graduate students to Los Alamos and have this career pipeline. And she hadn't really gotten any takers yet. And so, so she, she really, she did quite a job. I, long story short, I also think it was a very good, good choice for me, but she, I think she did have some ulterior motives. So what's some of the chemistry that we've been doing? I just want to highlight a couple of, of um, research results from, from our group. One of the things we worked on was separations along the same theme of separating out actinides from other things present. Well, where do you have to do that? One place you have to do it is in the processing of nuclear fuel. And one of the most difficult separations to do is separate F elements, the actinide series and the lanthanide series. And so one of the kinds of ligands um, that we looked at is diethiophosphonates because it was observed in uh, column experiments that separation factors, the ratio of how much of the target actinide, uranium or plutonium, might have versus how much of the lanthanide you would get of the same size these were the separation factors. So you could see these we thought were kind of promising. So for quite a long time, we studied a whole bunch of these kinds of compounds. And it's, it's summarized in this paper that I wrote together with one of my postdocs, Andrew Gaunt. But I wanted to show this slide for a few reasons, because I've been talking a lot about radiochemistry. And I sort of want to make a pitch for inorganic chemistry, particularly the inorganic chemistry of things that are radioactive. I've, always love doing plutonium chemistry. And I just want to point out some of the beautiful crystals that we made of a plutonium-3 complex. And this particular plutonium-3 complex is bonded to by selenium, which it, for inorganic chemists is a very unusual kind of ligand. Usually, you think of chemistry in terms of like things like other like things, like ions dissolved in water, which is ionic. heavy. Um, atoms like other heavy atoms, or hard metals like hard ligands. So plutonium, and this is absolutely true, if you think of plutonium 
and uranium compounds that you may know of, it's oxides or it's um, mineral ores. And so those are the compounds that you most see um, where you most see plutonium forming very strong bonds. So we actually were quite interested to see plutonium forming bonds with the very soft selenium and even more surprised when we were able to make a plutonium bonded to tellurium. So m making a connection back to um, the research of understanding what element you make, here what we were trying to do is looking at what kind of bond you could make. What would be the reactivity um, of plutonium and so this was this was a kind of an interesting result because if someone would have told me 20 years ago that plutonium would bond to tellurium, I wouldn't have believed them. Another area that we looked at, and this is related to supporting the effort to isolate nuclear waste in geologic repositories, is um, determining stability constants, thermodynamic data that you could put in computer and modeling codes to predict the fate and transport of these radioactive elements. So be those radioactive elements that are already in the environment from past practices, or be they elements that you would like to isolate, for example, at the WIP site. And so one of, the, one of our contributions was that we did a lot of fundamental studies with simple, relatively simple ligands, but ligands that are very important in the environmental context. You might have heard um, in the WIP environment, the nitrate and plutonium were very um, important. Chloride is also very important because it's in all the brines and, and salt media, carbonate from uh, the atmosphere. And what I just show here one of our examples with some interesting difference um, between uranium-6 and plutonium-6 because most people think if you have elements of the same oxidation state in the same size and in the same periodic, in the same family, they're going to behave chemically very similar like the lanthanides do. So for example, you know, gallium-3 um, looks, uh, behaves very similar to neodymium-3. This is a case where uranium-6, not only did it um, behave very differently in a hydroxide media, but it formed different species. And so we, um, we studied these stability constants, and these are one of, um, these are a handful of thousands of numbers that go into computer codes to model and predict the fate of actinides, for example, for um, certifying nuclear waste repositories. Um, another area that we spent um, some time uh, researching was the interaction of uh, radionuclides with environmental bacteria. And this was for a couple of reasons. One reason was to, to look if specific kinds of mechanisms of environmental bacteria um, interacting with metals could be used to bioremediate those metals. The other reason is, again, for nuclear waste isolation. If you want to understand how these elements might behave with um, components in the environmental media, you certainly have to include um, the bac bacteria and the microorganisms. And so we studied, actually, all of these different kinds of uh, microbial bacterial processes with plutonium. And I just want to highlight one of them, which is the internalization and the uptake of plutonium by bacteria. Because I think it's really particularly interesting because it's against what we would predict. And, um, and so what we studied was the sideriform mediated uptake of plutonium by the same processes by which the bacteria takes up iron. Now this is in part surprising because I already mentioned that um, plutonium, you might think plutonium-4 would act like uranium-4, but you don't necessarily think that plutonium-4 would act like iron-3. You also think that bacteria would be very picky about what they would take up through the process by which they get their nutrient iron. So this was a, um, quite a surprising result, which we actually were able to show in a number of different type of bacteria and with a number of different type of siderophore, and the word siderophore means iron-loving molecules. So we found these iron-loving molecules also love plutonium and in fact can take them up, facilitate their take up into bacteria. So now I'm going to um, shift to, to the end of my talk just to highlight some other contributions of a different type that Darlene has made over her career. And I wanted to point out, I already pointed out that Darlene was a first technical division, first division leader of a technical division at Los Alamos. She had a number of other firsts. And the first one I thought 
on this list I think is, is pretty remarkable because it's one of the ones that Darlene told me about with, um, with some very interesting stories attached to it and that is that Darlene in um, the early 1950s was the first female that was allowed on a nuclear weapons test drill back. So the, what that means is they would take, they build devices in Los Alamos, they would ship them to Nevada, they would explode them underground, then drill back teams would come in, take samples from different areas, different points um, in different radii around the explosion to figure out what the um, different attributes of the explosion. And parts of that are classified, so I'm going to stay away from all of that. But essentially what they do is collect a whole bunch of samples at very specific time points and geometries, and they would bring them back to Los Alamos for analysis. Well, Darlene, when she showed up at, Nev at the Nevada test site, well, first, she wasn't sure she should go. It was, it was not common for, for women as we met, Eve, to go to Nevada, must, much less to go with the drillers out on rigs. This was a rough and very male environment. In fact, it was so much the case that the drillers were very superstitious. They thought it would bring them bad luck and they wanted no part of it. So it, it, this is where Marvin really had to help out and step in and say, because she'd say, well, maybe I just shouldn't do this. And he said, well, of course you should. There's no reason why you shouldn't. And I think it was really remarkable that she had that kind of support. She was also, whenever it came up, as it um, sometimes does today, when um, different people at the laboratory want to go to the same conference, the laboratory will ask, well, do all of you need to go? And Mar Marvin and Darlene are both, um, both very much enjoy telling the stories of a couple of times when they were both supposed to go to conferences and the, um, the approval would come through that Marvin was going to go to the conference and Darlene wasn't. And Marvin tells me a story of a couple of times, picking up the phone and calling the person who made the decision. He said, if only one can go, my wife will go. Don't you know she's a better scientist than I am? I just, I just love that story. So um, Darlene did, was very, um, very much a trailblazer and, and did indeed go back to Nevada many, many times. She said after the first time they weren't so superstitious about it. She also tells great stories of what life was like at the test site. It, it's, it was quite an amazing time. Darlene was the first of a number of different awards. She also, it was very noteworthy, that she was the second female, the chemistry faculty department at UC Berkeley. That was in 1984. A little bit surprising because there were about 45 professors. Judith Klinman, by the way, a biophysical um, chemist, was the first female chemist. Darlene also, um, I think the, the, she was a very, um, very pleased and um, surprised to be awarded the Priestley Medal for the ACS. It's one that she holds, holds quite dear. Um, and she was also in 1997 awarded the National Medal of Science, which is um, extraordinarily competitive. And that was also quite a big surprise for her. In both cases, she said, well, yeah, someone told me that they had nominated me, but I never, ever imagined that, that I would um, be awarded such prizes at such levels. Um, I just want in the next couple of slides point out um, Darlene's contributions and I, I don't have any slides on the very large number of national and international advisory groups and studies to which Darlene has contributed um, as a leader, as a consultant, um, probably in the hundreds at, at this point in her career. Um, and she's, she's very regularly turned to for, for her um, thoughtfulness, and her, her vision combined with her pragmatism. Um, I do want to say something about the Seaborg Institutes, and Darlene has also been quite an advocate for nuclear forensics programs. So now making the arc um, to present day. And on this slide, I um, show a picture of Annie Kirsting, one of our colleagues. She also is quite a close uh, friend of Darlene's. They actually met because they live in the same neighborhood in the Oakland Hills above Berkeley. And um, before she became um, director of the Seaborg Institute at Livermore Labs, um, Annie started meeting with Darlene as a mentor. And they um, would meet after Darlene would go for her morning swim on Friday morning. She would come and 
um, Annie would come to her house and they would have tea or coffee together. And I'm happy to report that they still meet almost every week after Darlene's swim to have tea and coffee and to discuss um, Annie's leadership of the Seaborg Institute at Livermore. So I, I was, um, in 1991, I was the first student of the first Seaborg Institute that was uh, formed. And then when I did a short postdoc at Lawrence Livermore Lab, I was the first postdoc of that institute. And then when I came to Los Alamos, um, I was one of the um, committee members that selected Dave Clark for the Seaborg Institute leader here when it formed in 1994. The three current directors are Albert Migliori at Lo Los Alamos, David Shu at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, and Annie um, Livermore. And I just wanted to point out that this was really the vision of Darlene and a couple of her colleagues at Lawrence Livermore Lab that as they were watching radiochemistry numbers of PhDs, they were seeing them dropping, and they were certain that it would not fill, fulfill the national needs. And so being Darlene, she did something about it. And um, she, she really, uh, she went to Washington. She found funding for it. She worked with her colleagues across the National Lab Complex to establish uh, these three institutes. And I just wanted to point out some statistics from the institute that Annie's leading from 2012 that indeed they are making a difference because they, they are producing um, and generating a pipeline for world-class talent for the National Laboratories. Um, this is another slide from Annie, but this is another multi-institutional um, effort. This is another one that Darlene was instrumental in supporting. It was also um, strongly supported by Kim Badil at Lawrence Livermore Lab and Carol Burns at, at, um, Los, here at Los Alamos. And that is um, the DNDO, the Domestic Nuclear Detection Office, because people like Darlene in her, her advisory committee's work would say, we have this need for nuclear forensics. We have the threats of dirty bombs. We have these other threats. We need the capabilities, um, some of which um, need to be modified from the long legacy that we have from nuclear test diagnostics. But we need to have new detection techniques and new capability. And we have to have a newly trained workforce to meet this need for nuclear forensics. And so this is one of Annie's slides showing some of the statistics and the numbers they have, for example, it takes, they figure it takes about eight years to go from student to full-time staff. And as of 2012, they've hired seven full-time staff. That came in their door from this nuclear forensics program, student program. So with that, I'd like to um, make some acknowledgments. I had um, help from a lot of colleagues getting all of these photographs and um, putting these accomplishments together. I'd like to thank Alan Carr, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the archivists from the different national laboratories who brought together these photos. Um, some of my colleagues at Los Alamos, Kim Thomas and Dave Hobart, for the sharing their stories. I've mentioned Don Shaughnessy's re research, one of my fellow uh, graduate students in the Hoffman Group, and these uh, current day radiochemists at Los Alamos. And most of all, of course, I would like to acknowledge Dar Darlene. She was a terrific. PhD advisor and has continued to be a wonderful role model and mentor. And I wanted just to tell a couple stories associated with this because this is a, this photograph in the upper left is sort of a different side of Darlene that doesn't get mentioned um, as much as I think it might. Going through, um, looking at the LAL archives, we came across this photograph, which I had never seen before. All these other photographs I'd seen before. And so last year, I was with Darlene and I asked her about this photograph. I said, I've never seen it and you look so glamorous, Darlene. That was, I mean, and look at that photograph. It's just remarkable. And she said, oh, I was always trying to um, imitate movie stars and Hollywood stars. And I said, really? Is that? And she said, well, yeah, look at that hairstyle. Don't you think that's Lauren Bacall? So, I, so so Darlene very much is a full and well-rounded person. She had um, a very, she's very devoted to her family. This is um, her husband Marvin, or her daughter Maureen, and her, her son Daryl, both of whom are physicians. Uh, Maureen is a very um, highly esteemed medical researcher at um, Duke Medical School, and um, Daryl is a plastic surgeon in the San Francisco Bay Area and was part of the lure 
to get Darlene and, and uh, Marvin to move from Los Alamos to California because Daryl um, and his wife Susan were already there with their three grandchildren. So, um, and I, um, this is just a, a photograph of, of my family because there are a number of different times, both through my career and through my personal life, where I would call and ask Darlene questions. For example, when I was pregnant for the first time, how do I be a working mom? And she, you know, she just sort of laughed and she said, well, you just do it and you outsource. <laughs> Darlene was, um, you know, Sheryl Sandberg's book, Leaning In, Darlene was leaning in way ahead of her time. And so she described to me, well, you have somebody else, make sure that the dinner's there, you, you get help from, um, for, for daycare, and you can't do it all. And she was very firm about that, as was Darlene, and, or as was Marvin. And Marvin, you know, I remember we going out to dinner with, with um, them and, and Marvin say, saying, well, you know, but it might be different today, Darlene. Maybe she can't find a full-time housekeeper and someone who will take care of her children. And Darlene, then they would have, then they, right in front of me, they just had this discussion of how it's absolutely, it must happen for working women to be able to have fulfilling um, careers as well as a full family life. Most importantly, should they choose to do so? And that was one of the um, decisions that was very important in Darlene's life when she decided to change from fine arts to chemistry is she asked herself that question because at that time before World War II if you were pregnant and you were a teacher which a lot of the people in her family were teachers if you got pregnant you lost your job and it wasn't a choice it was you you did and as Darlene put it as well fortunately the genie came out of the bottle and never got put back in so she found that her life as a working mom was much more acceptable over time. And when um, my husband and I had the opportunity to do a change of station in Washington, D.C., I asked her about, well, do you really take your family across country and take another job for a year? I mean, is this really fair to all of them? And she said, well, I took my whole family to Norway when my kids were that age, and it was really good for them. And so she, she really has given me tremendous advice over the years and has been a wonderful role model. And so in closing, I just want to uh, start or uh, end where I started, which is spheres of influence. And so I, I have pointed out some of the technical aspects of Darlene's career where she has really influenced nuclear and radiochemists for generations and transgenic researchers, also working women, particularly women and women in science. But she's really a terrific role model for all of us in that the sort of the phrase of just do it because she was an, an intrepid researcher and she, um, she didn't feel like she was really that much of a trailblazer all the time that she has continued to blaze new trails. So thank you for giving me this opportunity, Linda, and um, I would just love if, if, uh, if anybody would like to share other stories of Darlene. Mary, thank you. I really enjoyed that, Mary. Thanks so much. So we have time for a few questions or comments, as Mary's called for. Um, anyone would love to hear from you all. No one, no one? No takers? No, no questions? takers, no questions? Any radio comments? All right. Oh, great. And I'm really glad to see students here. Yeah, as well. me too. Me too. Is Marvin still alive? Yes, he is. Marvin's had um, a number of health issues, but I'm happy to report Darlene has always been in excellent health. And Darlene and Marvin is also doing quite well. Well, if there are no other questions, Mary, thank you again so very much. Thank you.